Well, while we're waiting, I just wanted to announce as I announced in the curriculum committee meeting that there is a massive um, outage of Zoom across that's affecting the entire East Coast and also some other telecommunications. So um, if I need to turn off my um, uh, camera, that's why. <laughs> It, it didn't happen in the last meeting, um, but it's being widely reported. The Ithaca College uh, email that came out said it was degraded Zoom service. I thought that was an interesting choice of words to, to talk about it. But uh, Rob, I do believe we have a quorum at this point in time. So handing it over to you. Great, and without further ado, we'll uh, go ahead and call this uh, public voting meeting to order of uh, the Board of Education of the, of the Ithaca City School District. And I do believe we'll go right into a second session for the appropriate reasons and we'll need a motion and a second to do that. And um, I believe the, uh, the board will meet um, for a bit, but then uh, we'll invite Dr. Brown to come join us, I believe. And that was what I would like to happen, but um, go ahead and, and um, ready for a motion and we can call the roll. I move that we enter into exact session to discuss um, school district business, matters of employment and ongoing uh, litigation. I don't know. <laughs> Second. Second by Pat, thank you, Chris. Um, Tricia, please go ahead and call the roll. Rob Yeah. Erin Coro? Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell? Yes. Eldred Harris? Yes. Nicole LaFave? Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Ann Reichland? Yes. Pat Wasman? Yes. Very good. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we're going to jump out to a breakout room and we'll be back shortly and should be right around seven o'clock for public session. So thanks everybody. We'll join our exact session breakout room. So we are, we are back, correct? And from an extended exec session, and I do believe we have a, we do have our quorum. So we're back and, um, and ready for a public portion of our meeting tonight. And I, unless I'm mistaken, I don't believe there's any modifications to the agenda as presented. Um, I don't believe so, correct? Not hearing any. So, um, so let's go on no, to uh, the public comment period. And uh, Tricia, Emily, I believe there was one person signed up and then anyone else who wishes to speak uh, will uh, we'll entertain those folks as well. Hi, Rob. Um, Mr. Adam Jacobstein would like to speak. Uh, hi, uh, thanks. thanks for uh, listening. Thanks for serving on the board. Uh, I just wanted to um, offer my perspective. I'm a parent of a DeWitt and I student, and um, you know, for <laughs> both both my my children are, are learning in person. And um, from what I've been hearing from the elementary schools, the in person thing is is going really well. Most of the teachers there um, the past couple months. Uh, it's been really frustrating for both of them and, and for a lot of their friends because they're going to school and most of their teachers aren't actually there. I'm sure you, know, you guys, you know all this, but um, I just wanted to offer my, uh, my opinion and perspective that the ICSC should um, put forward a, a date and a goal of eliminating hybrid learning going by person with teachers getting vaccinated and um, 
with all the science coming out about land transportation in schools that uh, that needs to be a public goal. We need time to get on board, and that some teachers may never get on board, and that's going to have to be okay. Some you know, the teachers union may never may never be on board with that. That's just you know whether that's in March or April or September. You know that's going to have to be okay, and I hope that. Uh, School board will consider a uh, move like this. I think the kids are a lot of kids are hearing it. They're dropping out of high school, going in, in person because they're just they go there and, and there's a teacher on the computer screen, and um, that's frustrating. I also did want to comment that I really appreciated the uh, ICSD athletics for doing the in person uh, training sessions. It was really like a lifeline for my older son. And uh, really happy to, to hear that they're going to be starting that up again February 1st. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adam. Anyone else? Tricia, raise a hand at this time. Um, checking in the chat right now, Rod, as well as uh, to see if there's a raised hand. I don't see anyone else at this at this moment. Very good, Tricia. We're uh, we're always happy to hear from uh, folks from the community, uh, and please feel free to um, continue to tune in. And um, so let's move on right on to uh, student reps, and that would be Ithaca High. Uh, we are a bit behind, so we'll just keep moving. And so Ithaca High and everyone that's done a great job all year. Hi, um, I'm Adam, I'm one of the rest of the board. Um, so uh, now uh, this morning, um, all, many, many Ithaca High School juniors took the PSAT. Um, it's uh, from what I understand, uh, the first big time that uh, students have come back to school um, for a test of sorts like this, um, so. Uh, it's definitely uh, nice that we are able to kind of return to a sense of familiarity. Um, recently, uh, IHS Competitive Athletics have begun again, one team who had their first um, both in-person and virtual meets um, in the past week. So that's definitely exciting to hear about. And we'll see where sports can go from here uh, in the current COVID situation. Um, this week, uh, there will be a performance of student-directed one-act plays as well. Uh, so we are looking forward to seeing those. Um, as many of you may know, uh, February is Black History Month. So at Ithaca High School, the first week of um, of February will be Black Lives Matter week, where there will be many uh, student and um, community presentations and a lot of uh, discussions and activities surrounding um, the issues of social justice, racial justice, and many more. Um, hi, I'm Grace. I'm another uh, student rep. So I would like to say that we are still continuing our work with the IHS administration. Um, just yesterday, we had a meeting with them and we're talking about creating another school-wide survey um, just uh, for the beginning of the third quarter, um, discussing a range of topics from academics to classroom engagement um, to like COVID safety. So we are planning on working closely with the IHS administration to create the survey. Um, there, there's also an increased student participation in these topics because we have, um, Ms. Arnold has made a new Wednesday morning meeting. So there's a more, a diverse background of students can participate in these conversations. Uh, hi, I'm Alex. I'm also a student rep. 
So we've continued to hear some discussions uh, between like some students and teachers about their concerns, their continued concerns over technology. And um, I know we've like discussed this in the past. So we were just wondering if you guys had any updates on any programs that you guys were doing or any work that you're doing on that issue. Hi, I'm Emma Zonin. Um, so after the last board meeting, many students were surprised by Dr. Brown's sudden resignation. Uh, following his announcement, many serious allegations were spread in the community, leaving quite a few students confused and upset as to the reason of his departure and what an, what an empty superintendent position will mean for the district and for the rest of the year. Um, so we were wondering how will Dr. Brown's resignation impact the district and you know our lives as students um, and also the accusations made, mentioned in the circulating document were quite serious and while there remain to be allegations and um, many students wonder if the board is planning on addressing the allegations directly to the school to clear up any misunderstandings that may be had. Thanks everyone. Um, any board responses at this time? This is Ann here. I just have a follow up question. Um, again, thank you so much for all of what you've been doing. And I, my question has to do with the surveys, because I think this is really exciting that you're like surveying the student body in real time. So my question is, when you do the surveys and you're getting information, how is the loop in terms of the information you get and how we're able to absorb that information or work with the information that you know, like where is the information from the survey going once you collect it? Um, so the last time we uh, sent out a, a general survey, um, we gave all of the information um, to the Ithaca High School administration. And uh, we routinely also do smaller scale surveys uh, with more quick turnarounds that are often very um, targeted uh, using social media. Um, that we share with the Ithaca High School Administration and with uh, Ms. Arnold, the, act the Student Activities Director, um, which they then use uh, to um, like direct department meetings. Uh, there are also um, staff and student involved committees now on grading and uh, attendance and engagement. And so a lot of that feedback goes there as well. Um, but it's been the last time we sent out uh, a more like general survey was, if I remember correctly, back in November. And so we want to kind of collect uh, more information and see how much we've progressed since then, uh, what has changed, what hasn't, what needs to be improved on, um, and where to go from here. And uh, in terms of topics, uh, focusing on anything from uh, technology um, to the in-person and online experience uh, to COVID safety in school. Um, so, yeah. Great, thanks. Thanks, Adam. Anyone else at this time? Um, Go ahead, Maura. I have a question uh, um, really for our uh, leadership team um, regarding the starting of sports. So I've just been you know, reading what's in the media that the decision was being left up to local health officials. Um, so, I, you know, what I'm hearing tonight is apparently we are going ahead, but I'd really like to hear some more specifics about who's doing what. Um, yes, yes ma'am, I can speak to that. Um, we had a, a, a gathering this afternoon uh, with local health officials. Um, we have the go ahead to begin quote unquote high risk sports um, as of February 1st, and that is the plan. Now there are many details to be worked out. Um, can we travel from Tompkins County to another county to compete? Items like that are still in negotiation, but uh, as of right now, we are planning to begin sports on February 1st. Um, working closely with the, the health department and folks in our section. 
and most importantly, uh, with Ms. Little, under Ms. Little's leadership uh, with other ADs across our region. Thanks, Dr. Brown. I'm glad the turf is basically done. Uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. Um, anything else right now before we hop to the consent and then other things, other items? And we'll address, would, go ahead. Um, I would like to just address uh, Mr. Jacobstein, who uh, made a comment earlier about hybrid, the hybrid model and virtual learning. And um, one, um, thanking you for your comments and two, Empathize with you um, having a middle schooler who is struggling with the, the virtual learning, who is typically on the honor roll and having a hard time adjusting to um, the hybrid model and looking at our admin team or exec team to be able to speak more to how are we evaluating um, success and engagement. Um, we've been we've been living like this for 11 months, but we've we're in January now and just wondering how Lynn, um, our evaluator, and all of you are talking about success and engagement and where we are with grading. Um, I know that we had a conversation a couple of months ago, but wondering where we are in terms of middle school and high school grade and how we're looking at those topics. Lily, you wanna share a brief synopsis of where we are right now? And we can talk about this as another agenda item later. Sure, absolutely. Good evening to you. Thanks for the question, Nicole. So in terms of evaluation in regard to where we are and the different modes, and we talked a little bit about this at our last curriculum committee, um, that uh, you know some folks have asked us to really compare in-person versus hybrid versus distance as well. Um, and that there are some there's some challenges associated with doing that, just knowing uh, that we can't control for a number of factors like who selected it, right? Um, and, and all of that. Um, however, that being said, we're still, of course, monitoring the data, how are kiddos, how are kiddos doing? So we're able to go in and see if kids are engaging on Canvas or not, right? And so that provides one level of information to us in order to, for us, for our deans and for our associate principals and principals and counselors and social workers and others to reach out directly to kids and connect with them, see what they may need um, and make physically distant home visits, right? Call them up, right? Um, all sorts of things. Um, so, so we're using, we're using uh, data from Canvas to allow us to understand engagement, but then of course also grades. And and you're right, grading is grading is frankly quite messy right now, right? Um, and there are a lot of approaches, a lot of approaches from a lot of different school districts across the country right now um, that of course we've we've taken a look at. And I would say the the folks at Ithaca High School department leaders, departments um, themselves, and the the folks at uh, Boynton and DeWitt as well. They're really trying to find the best way forward to support kids, right? Um, and to help ensure that they're, they're still learning, right? So um, the high school is working on um, essentially a, a safety net system. And so they're working to communicate that out with caregivers um, and others um, in the, um, you know, they've been doing some communication and are gonna be communicating more. Um, and I, I believe Mr. Mitchell was on uh, briefly as well. And he's been doing great work around that, uh, Jackie Richardson as well. Um, and, the, and the grading committee that's working with Jackie Richardson and Lynn Vanderwart, um, they're starting back again. And frankly, they're trying to take a long-term approach, right? Um, so there's essentially some emergency shifts that we know that we need to make right now, right? So um, in what ways can we leave the door open for kids who may not, who may be missing a great number of assignments right now, right? And we're starting second semester soon. So in what ways can we leave the door open for those students and find ways to still allow them to get credit and to pass the class, right? Um, so that's where we are. Dr. Brown, uh, I don't know if you had anything else that you wanted to add or anything else you wanted to share. 
good to know. And maybe we bring this up as a topic. Uh, we'll, we'll work with the board officers, maybe bring this up again at our next meeting and go a little bit deeper. Absolutely, Dr. Brown. It's, uh, it's a topic front of mind, and uh, we'd like to uh, dig into it a bit. Anything else right now before we move on with the rest of the agenda? Not hearing anything. Uh, if we could, um, let's go to the consent. Thanks, everyone, um, for your comments. And just need a, a motion and a second, and then we can address any questions regarding the consent agenda. Before, um, I'm sorry to interject. Um, before we move on, um, Emma raised um, some points that are very widespread throughout the student body right now. And we would really appreciate it if um, you as the board would address um, the current situation just to um, give us your position or um, where the board is at right now um, in terms of the current situation. Adam, I'll, uh, I'll address that if we could uh, after the consent agenda is dealt with and we can get into uh, the, uh, the bulk of the uh, business before the board. And so we'll do that in a few minutes. Uh, I'll move the consent agenda. Second. Thing by Chris, uh, moved by Moira. Uh, Chris, um, just a few items if you want to address. Sure, there's quite a bit. Um, I'd love to sh uh, shout out the 6.5 appropriation of funds for the Park Foundation Culturally Historically Responsive Literature Project. A uh, special thank you to Mary Grover uh, for the heavy lifting and the work with that $40,000. Um, there's a, a lot in this consent agenda that we went over in finance. Also, resolution to approve the agreement with uh, Tetra Tech for um, DeWitt Middle School's capital project. Um, the appointment of a claims auditor. What else? Yeah, we've got a lot in there. Um, and then there's some Title I, sorry, um, money being moved around or accepted rather. So please uh, folks dig in there. We cover a lot of this in finance and go into great detail, but there's a lot, um, but special shout out to uh, Mary Grover with the work she did with uh, the Park Foundation Cultural Historic Responsive Literature Project. And Chris, I would give a shout out to Rob Swartout, who is Swartout, who is consistently donated to the uh, Ithaca athletic programs over many, many years, and um, and doing another gift to uh, the athletics program. Just to point out, um, community members may, can make gifts to the school district and designate where they want them to go, and it is um, you can uh, certainly direct your support. Any other questions regarding the consent? Chris, would you be able to speak to the farm to table, which is on the consent agenda? Um, Amanda, could you help me out with that? We did cover it. I'm drawing a blank. That's another shout out to Mary, right? For farm to table. And so um, I'm just trying to I'm just trying to find the language on the consent agenda right now. Um, State of New York, 21st Century Community Learning Centers. Yeah, but right. So this is just this is. Thank you, Moira. I had to find the first part of that language. I was looking through the list. So essentially. Mary, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I just want to make sure this is really just receipt. We've we've applied for this grant. This funding comes in, and then this is just accepting of the purposes that were written in the grant. There's really nothing new to this. This is just sort of the way that it rolls in um, via payments. Mary, how'd I do? Excellent. Yeah. 
You good, Nicole? Anything else from anyone? If not, Tricia, if you could call the roll. Sure. Rob Ainsley? Yes. Erin Croyle? Yes. Sean Eversley Bradwell? Eldred Harris? I have to finish chewing, yes. Nicola Fave? Yes. Moira Lang? Yes. Chris Malcolm? Yes. Ann Reichland? Yes. Pat Wazian? Yes. Very good. Thanks, everyone. Um, on to uh, Dr. Brown and uh, superintendent's report and announcement. Uh, thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Andy. It's good to see you all. And we have much to get to this evening, particularly around budget and where our financial forecast, what our financial forecast is saying. But yes, I heard uh, Emma and I heard Adam, and I've heard from a lot of students, quite frankly, over the last couple of weeks, and a lot of community members. Um, and I just wish to clarify some things and share some new thinking. At our last meeting, yes, I did uh, uh, speak to my wishes to transition um, to a new role uh, in February. Um, that's not going to happen. I'm uh, after many conversations and reflections. Um, I'm wishing to be here and serving as your superintendent and this community um, going forward and indefinitely. We have much work to do, um, and, I, and you'll be hearing about that work tonight and in every meeting about the work we need to do in our community. Um, but yes, I, I recognize uh, the stir that I caused by talking about a transition. Um, but Emma, uh, I look forward to seeing you at the next Superintendent Advisory Council, Adam, and other places, and all of the young people and community members who reached out wishing for us to con continue um, the work. Um, so thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Angeli, and I look forward to the conversations we have tonight and going forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, and Adam, I didn't, well, I didn't want to uh, step on. Uh, Dr. Brown being able to speak to the subject. So that's why I did not speak to the subject earlier. Um, so just to clarify, um, for the superintendent to actually resign from the district, it is necessary via his contract that he sends a letter to the board president, which happens to be me. Um, that never happened. Um, we were in the talking stage, basically, um, obviously supportive of uh, Dr. Brown's work here, uh, statewide and nationally. Uh, but uh, we, a uh, series of talks uh, with the board, and um, you know, I think the uh, the main point is the board gave Dr. Brown the opportunity to change his mind, and indeed he did so. Um, and Dr. Brown, your heart and soul is with the Ithaca City School District public education being in a public role and you know we are more than happy to have you uh, lead this district and continue the work that we started 10 years ago and there, but there's a lot more work to do dr brown and um you have a contract and um we're going to hold you to it so right. um there's um so it's an opportunity to move forward um we're glad to answer any and all questions uh but uh, indeed and in fact dr brown never formally resigned from the district. He has a contract. He is a superintendent. He will continue to be the superintendent. It's all hands on deck as we uh, continue to uh, put this district back together through this COVID uh, crisis. And uh, it's, uh, we're, uh, we look forward to having our full exec team uh, throughout the rest of the year and into the summer and into next year as we go into fully hoping that next fall we are fully in-person instruction and, uh, and we uh, certainly migrate out of a hybrid learning uh, environment that we are in right now in this spring semester of 2021. And, uh, but very happy that uh, I did see driving by the high school that uh, uh, school, school uh, sports registrations for fall sports, I, it said, I believe was uh, February 1st, but uh, you know, we'll see, but uh, there will be some sort of uh, fall athletic schedule and hopefully a full co curricular schedule by the time we're uh, done in June. But uh, Dr. Brown, we are uh, 
we're, we're open. Um, we are open to discussions about any topic that anyone wants to talk about. And as long as it's about the school district and, and what we do and how we move forward with the district. So um, without further ado, Dr. Brown, if you're good, we'll, um, we'll go on to um, the uh, budget and the revenue projections. And as we put a budget together for this next school year. Yeah. Amanda, I think we unmute and share some of your updates and uh, thinking about what we're going to be doing with this budget process this year. Great. And I think Tricia will be um, presenting for us the few slides that we pulled together for you so that um, folks can see this, uh, you know, at any time that they want to look in on, on what the state is saying about the state revenue at this moment in time. So I want to be... Um, I want to be really forthcoming that uh, this uh, overview that we're going to do is really about how to understand um, the state aid runs that just were released at the end of last week. There was a lot of confusion about them. Um, it's a little bit premature to um, convert those state aid runs to actual what the budget would look like. So Trisha, if you don't mind going to the second slide, um, I wanted to just start to build a, a shared understanding of sort of uh, not only the process, but some of the new uh, factors and ways that we should be looking at the information that the governor shared. So um, many of you that have been through the budget processes before, or if, even if you're new to it, there's typically times in this cycle, right, starting in January um, that are predictable. So in January, we know that the governor um, releases essentially two school districts, um, a series, it's, you know, hundreds of pages of documents in terms of what did you receive last year and how it was allocated in different line items like reimbursement aids to school districts, and then what you will be receiving in your budget planning moving forward. And this is preliminary numbers, right? So these are not final. These are sort of his best guess um, in terms of what he believes he would like to take forward as the state budget. And there are also budget bills that are um, part of uh, his budget overview for the state. Those get sort of debated and there's lots of folks that give input and those go back and forth um, within the legislature. And then he comes with a, a final state budget um, in April. And that's what we use to drive our revenue. So there were a couple of things that made this year quite unique, obviously. Um, we know that from last year to this year, there were a number of um, adjustments that the governor used to actually decrease our state aid. They were called pandemic adjustments. And then there was federal aid monies that backfilled that adjustment. You're going to see that same type of language again this year, although the, the words themselves have changed, right? So you're going to see an adjustment or a reduction to our state aid numbers, and then there's going to be federal monies, just like last year, that will fill the gap. And so there was, um, you'll see those in the next slide soon um, when, we, when we transition, I'll point that out. There was also a lot of discussion from the governor regarding um, the potential for federal aid. So if you remember correctly, we received federal aid last fiscal year. Then again, there was more federal stimulus aid that came that was for COVID in December that was released to school districts. And now again, there's talk about more federal aid coming um, specifically to states that we hope would trickle down to school districts. And the governor's been talking about two key amounts, either $6 billion of federal aid coming to school to New York State or $15 billion of aid coming to New York State, depending on what's going to be happen federally. The budget that he released at this moment in time, and the numbers that you'll see on the state aid runs are based on the assumption that the um, $6 billion will come into effect, okay? And so if that doesn't happen, the governor has already warned that the numbers that we see in the state aid could be reduced. So that's why if you're looking at this slide and you're sort of reading kind of a few of the key pieces, um, number one, a lot of these federal aid packages, right, and stimulus monies are one year only. We, right now, there's an assumption that it's based on $6 million in addition to what is coming to us in December. These are not final numbers. 
Um, and also one of the surprises that, um, one not so surprising and one surprising, um, one of the not so surprising moments was that again, the governor compressed a whole bunch of aides, right? And you'll see those actually in the top um, right corner of this slide and put them into one line. That makes just our lives as school districts a lot more difficult because we have to actually take that one line item and break it down and figure out are the monies that actually are allocated in each one of the components of the larger services aid line, are those accurate? So we'll be doing that work as well. And then finally, the, go the governor's runs this year, and this was shocking to a lot of people, included the um, school district's star amounts. And so what essentially that was sort of, um, I want to avoid any loaded language here. It was a way to show school districts and communities another area of state support. And that goes directly to taxpayers. And so it was listed as sort of an aid, an assistance to schools, right? And so, I, you know, there was a lot of talk about, are they gonna try to eliminate it? What's happening? Um, what you'll notice for our district and many others, for me, the significance was they put the star amount there which yes, in fact, goes to our taxpayers to support um, their payment of tax bills. It's either a refund or a rebate um, that they get on, on the amount of money that they pay in taxes. But if you notice on our state aid runs, the amount of the um, withholding or um, decrease of aid is equal to the amount of the STAR payment. So Trisha, if you can go to the next slide, I'll try to show this in numbers. So for folks that like narrative, that slide probably appeals to you. This is more for folks that like the numbers, right? And so um, what I just wanna give you just a brief overview before we dive into this. So I tried to clean up um, the state aid runs in terms of what really was relevant for us to look at. So you'll notice here the star amount is off. It is not a state aid amount that we receive. Districts do not get that money. That, that is given directly to taxpayers to support taxpayers. And so I did not include that because it is not part of the picture of state aid, okay? Um, I also included uh, the the rows that um, were relevant to state aid in terms of what matters to us as school districts. And then the columns are the year that we're living in. And then if you move over to the right, futuring for next year or budget planning for next year. And again, these, this is not reflective of what will be in the budget. This is reflective of what the governor told us, the information at this moment in time that is the precursor to the final information that we will receive in April. But it's really important to track this. So a key, some of the key pieces of this, if you go along the very first row for foundation aid, which many board members have tracked for years on end, right? We, we it was going up and then in two, 2009, 2010, it plummeted and it was called the GEA or the gap elimination adjustment. And they removed state aid in terms of foundation aid and recalculated the formula and withheld aid to school districts. This aid amount that you see here, not only is it equal to last year, but it's equal to the year prior to last year. So 1920, because if you remember last year when I did this presentation, we actually had a much higher number in that foundation aid row. And due to the pandemic adjustment, it was decreased. And now we're at that decreased amount as our starting point. So that's very concerning. And if you look forward, right, my worries are, we need to make sure that we're not doing the budget in a one year only lens, that we're gonna really have to come to an agreement around our assumptions of what we might expect in 2023 and 2024. So right now that's locked in and it might, might continue to be or maybe even be decreased. And I'll give you my sort of reasoning for that in a moment. The services aid, as you can see there, again, if you, if you saw the prior slide, it includes things like BOCES aid, transportation aid, hardware technology, textbook aid. So that we're going to have to be piecing that out and pulling, um, pulling those pieces out to ensure we know what we want to budget. The high cost excess um, the, and the private excess cost are really about students um, who 
um, their education demands a higher cost per student because they need more services. So often that is our students um, who are receiving special education services either locally or actually pl placed privately. And so that aid is a reimbursement aid um, based on what we spend. And then the building aid, we talk about this a lot at both facilities and finance committee. And that is the aid that we receive on projects that have already occurred and that um, over the course of 15 years, we receive aid back when we secure debt and pay principal and interest on that. So that's also a number that's rather predictable and we can, we can look at that. So you'll see a subtotal after all of those and there's really not that significant of a difference of those. I just wanted to make sure, there we go. Okay, so then if you look just underneath the subtotal, okay, you're going to see from last year, the language used was pandemic adjustment. That was the decrease to the aid amount. This year, they're calling it a local adjustment. And it happens to be, again, that same amount that I said we receive in STAR. So that amount of money is backed out of our aid runs. And then we receive the reimbursement, or I'm sorry, the, the December stimulus money that was related to COVID released from the federal government to essentially backfill that decrease to get us to a place that's just above what um, the state aid run on that top would be. So that those are the numbers. Um, so for folks that like that, and again, we'll be doing more and more about this, especially at Finance Committee, and we'll be breaking these um, lines down. We're also, Trish, if you can go to the next slide. Um, you know, these are sort of the next steps. We'll be doing this with the board. We'll be doing this together as an executive team, um, and then really working our way toward those final numbers in April, right? So we have to analyze things. Um, we have to look at these numbers and make sure that they're accurate. They matter into that next piece to complete the tax cap calculation, specifically the building aid. We want to make sure that that is accurate and not accounting for projects that we didn't um, complete yet or that we didn't uh, file completion for. And then finally, we have to determine um, really what it is that we want to budget, right? So um, do we want to budget uh, assuming that all of that federal COVID stimulus money is gonna come our way? Or do we wanna actually look at that and say, well, what's the reality of that? Because most likely we're going to have to apply for it and we're going then to get reimbursed for things that we spent. And so we're gonna to have to spend some time on the discussion. So again, this is not a budget. This is just an overview of this moment in time based on what the governor released with lots of new factors and lots of familiar factors. And we just wanted to take an opportunity to be able to educate folks and share that information and then also let folks know what we will be doing with that in the future. Um, this is Anne. I, I actually have a question. First of all, thank you for putting this together because I did find those runs exceedingly confusing this year. But what I'm still trying to figure out is the, it looks like by the time you all calculated out, maybe we've kind of broken even, but is that only if federal, additional federal funds come to the state? So that if there are no additional federal funds in a COVID relief, that if that doesn't pass Congress, does that mean we're out $4 billion? So Tricia, can you just go back um, two slides, please, if you don't mind. So Anne, the assumption, right, of this budget is that um, this is based on additional $6 billion coming to New York State. However, it also includes the COVID relief funding that we got or received um, as of the December um, federal um, uh, uh, law that came into effect that, that essentially said that these monies would be trickling down to the state. So Tricia, can you go one more slide to the numbers? So, and to your point, the, the very, the second to last row across the bottom there that states CARES slash COVID-19 supplemental stimulus, right? The, the first column was last fiscal year's monies that, was, that were allocated 
uh, by the state to the school district in the amount of just over a million dollars. That was called the CARES Act. We're in the process right now of applying to receive that and proving that we spent money to address COVID needs in our schools, okay? The second column, that $4.9 million, that is money that is already part of the COVID-19 supplemental stimulus monies that was enacted in December, right? All of the other numbers, specifically foundation aid, if the $6 billion is not given to schools, that's what the governor is saying. Those are the things that will be in question. And perhaps there may be, um, this, this may be a rosy glow to state aid runs if that $6 billion does not come in. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, that's what I was worried about. And the other question I have is with the COVID supplemental aid that was supposed to be dedicated COVID aid, but when the governors, when the budget passed last year, we lost a certain amount of money and it was replenished with this COVID aid. But it seems like the COVID aid is tied to specific purposes. So how is that impacting core needs that we have if we can only use, say, that COVID aid for ventilation or whatever our needs might be. Yeah, and I, I want to be really clear. It's not aid, right? It's a replacement of money that was aid. Um, I, so I, I want to be very, very clear about that, right? So this is, this is essentially, it's a different funding stream to give us the money, to give school districts the money that they were owed. And you are absolutely correct. Um, Angela Jordan, myself, Emily Scheip, we have been working um, with all of our directors uh, to uh, document all of the costs that we had that were related to COVID. And essentially what you're doing is you are applying almost in the manner of reimbursement, right? So you're showing them all of the things that you spent spent the money on and then they're reimbursing you and um things do get kicked back they do say oh no we can't spend it on that i'm so sorry oh no that doesn't qualify and so we're actually working right now with them and also with fema to try to get additional federal money our way um, and so it's a lot of work to to get money that replaced our aid that could be used for general purposes, right? And general, I mean, important, the imperatives, the things that make us Ithaca, right? So um, we're, you're right. I, there are the, the, the guidance on the strings attached to the COVID-19 supplemental stimulus money is, is yet to be given to us. And so as soon as we know what those are, we'll be working to ensure that every dollar comes our way. Um, hey there, Amanda. Just wanted to, um, I don't think I've shared this with uh, Ann yet, but we're both on legislative action committee. I heard the um, chair of the New York State Senate Committee on Education, Shelley B. Meyer, she went pretty hard at Cuomo for this, um, almost this exact one-to-one -one dollar swap that we're discussing and, and really talked up the need for New York State to step up its commitment to public education and um, give it more aid, irrespective of what the federal government does. That may give us an opportunity to partner with her and find out more about how, the levers that she has to maybe um, enact something different. Uh, it's a little ridiculous that a state as large as New York is counting every chicken based on um, what the federal government does, just because the assumption is we have a president now who's more favorable uh, to making states whole. So we should pursue that. Um, it's not in my instinct to ever concede that what New York state does for kids is enough because we know how far behind they are. That's all I wanted to add. If I can find that link to her conversation, I'll make sure I send it to uh, the board. She was pretty direct and pretty powerful. Other questions for Amanda? What you're thinking, Amanda, just again, looking at the, at the hard and raw numbers, um, foundation aid being frozen for a third year in a row 
when you're speaking to that number, the, that number is the number indicated here. If we get, if there is six billion, if there's not, then that number could be anything or whatever. Is that what you're addressing, basically? That is, that is my understanding that this is based on the assumption that six billion additional dollars would be rolling into the state. All right, keep us flat. Uh, obviously, if it's a fifteen billion dollar number that is floating around, then then that changes the math. Uh, but still, um, when just caution, folks, when um, you know when money comes into the state. Uh, it doesn't flow to us all the time because we are not considered one of the higher needs districts and we support much from our local taxpayers. And so, um, you know, it's really hard to determine the impact of a cut or frankly, uh, a, a bonus if you, if you speaking of, of more, more aid than we expected. Um, it, Certainly, there are other districts will probably get uh, a higher percentage than we would get typically. Is that correct, Amanda? Right. It depends on their wealth ratio. So we're right smack dab in the middle, right? We're uh, we're like the the one, which is which is net like sort of neutral. Um, but th there are wealthier districts <laughs> we don't fare well typically, um, mainly for our wealth ratio, but also our location in New York State. Right, so um, as Ann has shared the formula many times along with many others, right? It goes to the big five, it goes downstate, it goes to Long Island, Westchester, you know, that area. And then the rest is the Hudson River West. And so it's, uh, we, we get a very small piece of the pie um, when, you know, the entire, uh, Western area, given the Hudson River West receives sort of um, only about, it's like just shy of 50% of the dollars that would roll into school districts at any time. And Amanda, that's why we thank uh, our local taxpayers every year for their support, uh, without whom we, you know, we could not do what we do here. Um, but that's, well, we do what we do here because our, our community uh, has expected that and frankly demands it. So again, trying to balance that, but um, you know, we are fortunate once again to be in a community that, that uh, is growing economically even within um, this era of uh, this year. But uh, you know, look around, there's, there's a lot happening. Um, students are coming back, meaning Cornell and the college uh, construction projects are continuing, um, you know, in the private sector, not uh, not just us, other people are building as well. So um, it's uh, it all goes to uh, building a, a very strong tax base, and we certainly look forward to uh, assistance from the state and to some extent the feds. But uh, you know, it is the local taxpayers that support our mission and the vision and the work that we do, and uh, it'll all work out, Amanda. Right. <clears throat> Robbie, you know, we'll, we will do the best we can. I, I have, I am so fortunate to have a team here in the business office that are, uh, you know, if you drive by, they're here on Sundays, they're working Saturdays, they are during budget season, there's such dedication. And we have an amazing team, um, right, of, of principals and directors and colleagues that just, and teachers that give input. And there's just, um, I really feel, I, I agree with you 100%. I, I, I think a lot of talk at finance committee has been about really trying to continue to build on communication, both to and from um, the community for input so that people really have confidence in what we're putting out. And, um, and, and we're trying to be as transparent as we can. And you're right, it is the, the taxpayers are so key in all of this. Um, they show up, they, they really um, ask amazing questions. And we want to make sure that we um, have an education system that really represents uh, what they're asking for and what they're paying for, right? So we're very proud of that, and I want to continue that. Um, I just wanted to piggyback on two things Amanda shared. Um, we really want to reach out to the public as far as as we go down this path of budget development. 
Um, so if there are any questions regarding the budget, how it's created, um, line items, please reach out to Amanda or myself um, and we'll make sure we have them available. We'll share them during finance and also at upcoming budget, I mean, sorry, upcoming voting meetings so we can share them forward. Uh, we want to really create that communication and that dialogue to kind of demystify our budget process and what goes into making a budget, especially this year where there's a lot of uncertainty. So please, if you have questions, um, email myself or Amanda or you know anyone else on the finance committee and we'll get those answered to you as quickly as we can. Thanks, Chris. And uh, the budget basically is going to have a uh, line item in the agenda for the rest of the year. I think, Amanda, correct? There's not going to be too many meetings that we're not talking about one part of the budget or the other. And so expect that. Must see TV on, two, on uh, those odd, odd Tuesday nights uh, when there's lots of, uh, lots of other things to do. Uh, but those uh, work sessions are uh, available to be viewed correct? And uh, it's a great way to uh, see the conversation and take part in it. Anything else, Amanda, that uh, anyone else regarding budget and the revenue side right now? If not, uh, let's just move on. There's the, uh, and, uh, you know, I'm going to hand it off, Le legislative advocacy. I always have trouble with that word, as you know, <laughs> Anne, uh, but uh, you have uh, an important uh, initiative that you wanted to speak to. Yeah, so let me just speak to that. And I'm hoping that Dr. Brown or Lily can also help me out or other uh, members of our committee. So um, as you know, one of the things that Legislative Advocacy Committee does is look at the intersection between what we do on the local level and then how what the state does and what the federal government does and how does that affect us. So uh, we are working, some of the things that we work on, one of them, of course, is asking for, you know, as you saw the, the, what Amanda just presented to us and making sure that the district has enough resources. And for that, we've already um, brought that to the board. We like to make sure that uh, the things that we're advocating for are things that the full board is in favor of. So uh, we're currently, have also already brought before the board the issue of the uh, uh, immunization registry as a way to improve the way that uh, vaccinations are recorded, the student vaccinations, it's a state mandate and we're trying to improve that. So one of the other issues and we're, the reason it comes up now is we're gonna be meeting um, with our legislators in the near future and we wanna bring to them sort of some more other things that we're interested in advocating for. And we wanna make sure that uh, the board uh, knows what that is and agrees with it before we go out and say, you know, uh, you know we are, we're gonna advocate on that. Um, so one of the things we've been thinking a lot about is there's been a tremendous amount of um, disruption, as you all know, as a result of COVID and the way education is done. A lot of things have been turned upside down. Things that have been done over and over again for years and years and years were all of a sudden questioned and rethought. So as horrible as this time is, there's also certain opportunities to rethink um, education. And for part of doing that, um, requires perhaps rethinking some of what those rules and regulations are. So um, I'm wondering, Dr. Brown, if you would just say a little bit about assessments and seat time and as one of the things we are um, thinking about. Yes, uh, and, and both things. We were hearing the last couple of days that our state is now behind us and asking for those things to be waived. Um, the assessment, we I wish for us to reimagine how we assess this notion of a standardized, quote unquote, standardized assessment is something I wish for us to rethink. Um, and, and we look for alternative approaches to assessment and giving us an indication of where our young people are. Um, seat time is another. I mean, I think we're, we're living it right now. Um, the requirements have been relaxed. Um, what does it mean to develop competency or achieve competency in a particular subject area? All things, I mean, and Lilia, you know the specific numbers, 100 and there's a, a certain number of hours that young people are required to be in a quote unquote seat. Um, that's something that we need to rethink, obviously, because of what we're dealing with right now in this pandemic. So all things that I'm hoping we have, we have a, a thoughtful, comprehensive conversation about using an anti-racist lens. Um, how do we build these structures and these new policies in a way that we're promoting equity versus uh, contributing to the systems of oppression that these 
previous uh, policies were intended to put in place. Billy, would you add anything to that? Cool. What, what I would just like to add to that, one of the purposes of this is when we're dealing with what we've been dealing with with COVID, some of these changes have happened by necessity. So you just can't do them, right? So then they say, well, I guess you don't have to do those certain number of hours. But going forward, if one is to actually innovate and use this experience as an opportunity for innovation, then I guess it might be useful to see how things like seat time interferes with innovation. So I don't know if, uh, if either Dr. Brown or Lily, if you want to just say how that specific issue would allow you to be more innovative in terms of how we educate in a non-COVID shutdown pandemic world. Go ahead, Ms. Tao, can you talk? And one of the things we've been discussing is how flexibility can allow us to adapt to what kids need more readily. So uh, not all kids may need to sit and be, you know, it's so interesting too, they call it seat time, right? Like you've gotta be sitting in order to, <laughs> to be learning, right? So we can't be moving while we're, while we're learning. Um, you know, some, some students actually may know some of the curriculum or the content or may already be familiar with some of the learning beforehand. Some students may need more time, right? They may need more flexible options, right? Um, and so, you know, we're thinking about knowing that the, the system has been disrupted. These requirements have been lifted now. And certainly this is not a perfect situation. We can't wait until COVID-19 is over, in fact, um, that there are some, some things that we're taking away and we understand are, are valuable, right? So students who may struggle coming into the school building who may suffer from significant anxiety, right? They may, they may continue to need some level of virtual learning and that might not look like them sitting for the same number of hours for a particular right? So we're trying to figure out how to um, center the students that our system has traditionally marginalized and take a more flexible approach in the future beyond COVID. So I guess what our committee is kind of asking the board is do we have kind of your blessing to advocate for these types of changes that um, would allow the district to be more intentional with the kinds of requirements, you know, the kinds of things that are required. Um, and uh, so that we could be a kind of more intentional, that the state could be more selective, I guess, with the requirements so that districts in turn could um, be more, uh, in, you know, experimental going or more successful and more constructive going forward. I don't know, Aldred or Aaron, do you have anything you want to add? Well, I mean, and as we talked uh, in our meeting last week, it's, um, sorry, my daughter was distracting me quite a bit, but uh, you know, the testing is antiquated, you know, seating is different. Um, I, I, it's something I think that is, it, we really need to explore. Uh, um, God, I'm not making sense at all, but no, I guess, I think we nailed it. <laughs> I'll only add, this is a continuation of the conversation. We know the state is having um, about um, rethinking many things that are old and tired, like regents exams, right? And that whole structure. We were all invited to BOCES to have that conversation, maybe this time last year, maybe it was before all the COVID thing exploded, but. Um, yeah, the, 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 the economy is shifting. The state needs to keep up or we'll just continue to um, uh, be in a position where we're not serving our 
kids in the best way possible. So we're all for it. But Dr. Brown almost came here. He almost came here talking about this this um, con sarnet uh, seat time. I won't use the words he used, but con sarnet is good enough. And here we are 10 years later, finally taking some steps to, um, to shift it. So yeah, I'm all for it. Both hands raised, three-pointer. I, I think just one of the funny things, not funny, one of the things about um, last year when everything's first shut down, I think it, there were like all these uh, specific rules that were always there and always on the book. And then all of a sudden they were waived. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's like, oh, you can do that. <laughs> so I think that's one of the uh, shifts, the uh, kind of uh, that that has taken place over the the last year. It's like, well, just because you've been doing it for the last 50 years in a certain way doesn't necessarily mean that the best uh, the best thing there. So anyway. So Anne, you're, uh, you know, this is not an item that we need to vote on, but certainly it is bringing it forward. And certainly um, from what I'm hearing, um, we certainly support uh, your, your working group to advocate for some flexibility. Um, and in the private sector, that's what everyone has to do. Um, there is, well, and I'm, I'm at work and there's no way that uh, in a hundred years that support staff would not have to be in, in, this, in this office and have certain hours here. And if they were somewhere else, that, that was basically against the law. You couldn't do that. Um, and that changed, you know, in a week. And, um, and Flex and he had to come up with a new way to do the, do the same work and, or do it better. And frankly, they're finding ways to do it better working remotely or being flexible in, uh, in hours. And, you know, just it's, uh, but it's, it's forcing innovation and it's forcing folks to take a look at their operations and how, how, you, how do you develop and complete your work product every day? And same goes for public education. How do we do what we do, uh, but with flexibility and, and better? Um, it, you know, I think that's, it always has to, it can't be, you know, what we're advocating for can't can't diminish the educational experience. It needs to augment it, to enhance it, right? And right. Well, in my in my opinion, a absolutely, absolutely. I think that's really vital. Yeah, it's not about diminishing it. It's it's about uh, you know. Um, as I say, it's about innovation. So it would have to be for a constructive purpose. And it's not like we have a specific thing at this time um, in terms of a specific uh, innovation, but I, I think that it would be advocating for um, making the process for, for getting those waivers perhaps easier if we had a specific proposal in mind um, that we knew we could uh, you know, maybe it's an evening, I'm just going to throw a few things out, you know, you know, like we've talked, you know, in earlier board meetings uh, about that, um, you know, an asynchronous Wednesday. I mean, I don't know, you know, I, I kind of fixed on that idea, you know, maybe asynchronous Wednesdays are actually really great. I don't know, one would have to assess it. But um, if it was right now under the current system on an ordinary school year, I don't think you could do that. So it would be nice to be able to say, well, we thought that was really uh, works for kids to have a day where we can do projects all day on Wednesdays and catch up on homework and have one on one time. It would be nice to be able to do that. So that that um, um, would be in my mind. That's what one of the things that I, I think of. Anyone else uh, on the subject um, before we wrap up? And uh, you know, we have a comment. Go, there you go, Nicole. Go ahead. Um, I want to thank Anne, Aaron, and Eldred for working on this. And I also just find it very fascinating that we can be at a place to be advocating to New York State education about making these shifts. But as a district, we can't agree on pass fail for our middle school students and high school students or eliminating late fees. So I think if this committee can get to a place where we're advocating New York State make some huge shifts that as a district, we can make some quick short-term wins for our students that we actually have the purview and privilege to do. 
Thank you, Nicole. Well said. Any, anything else um, before we wrap up? There's, um, um, Rob, I have yep, something. Uh, are we are we moved on to other discussion items? Is that okay? Um, the, listen, I know this is uncomfortable, but we had two students who asked a really difficult, really brave question. Um, Emma asked that question, and uh, Adam followed up. And I, I feel like we should at least take a moment to address them somehow. And I, if Emma wants to speak again, or I can paraphrase what she said, but I, I think that we need to acknowledge how brave they were to ask that mm -hmm. earlier. I can restate the question if that works for everybody. Um, Emma, I don't think you have to restate the question. I would, I'm looking at Rob, if Rob as our board president can just briefly speak to what he stated in the, the Ithaca voice, I think that that would be great. Okay. Is that okay, Emma? Well, see, not all students read the Ithaca voice, and I feel very strongly that these allegations, they, they impact students a lot, and students care about, you know, what's going to happen to them. And I think uh, as much as it's good news for the district and our schools to have Dr. Brown continuing his role as superintendent, it doesn't take away from like unanswered questions and these really serious circulating allegations. Um, and more importantly, how, how do we move on from that and how do we address them so we can do so? All right, Emma. We um, what uh, what I'm not going to do is get into a, you know a personnel matter in public. Um, I spoke to uh, a reporter uh, for the Ithaca Voice, and certainly we've been um, very open in uh, our dealings with allegations. Allegations are allegations. That's what they are. Um, so I will just do a, a quick. Um, you know we. Um, I'll go through it. Uh, I met with uh, a, a community member back in September um, and she uh, brought some uh, issues to my attention. I wasn't quite sure what she was talking about, but eventually I said, well, it, it, then it became clear. And I said, well, well we do not um, deal with um, private personal items of employees of this district. Uh, it's not our place. Um, but then eventually um, a packet of information, 200 pages long, was delivered to the district, uh, delivered to me um, the Thanksgiving week um, and the day before Thanksgiving, basically. And on Monday, I called our district attorney, um, not the district attorney, the district's attorney uh, that works for the district. And I said, go through it because we have an obligation to look into any and all uh, subjects, uh, issues, good or bad, that comes before the district because we are the Board of Education. That's our, that is our obligation, that is our uh, role, and that is what we do. And, um, and we have uh, to know whether there's any, any area that, um, that allegations of any kind put the district at risk um, so, uh, investigation was done, completed, um, and I got the uh, results. We got the, the board received results Christmas week, and so um, after Christmas week, I sent a response to uh, those who were uh, wrote the letter, um, and um, our investigator found that there was no justification for those allegations. There was nothing that the district did or had any, uh, you know, there was nothing there that uh, was going to impact the district. Um, there is, you know, I don't know how many different ways I can say it, but there, you know, it was investigated. The board did due diligence regarding all allegations and uh, found there was, they were unwarranted. So 
Um, social media can do whatever they do. Uh, does not mean whatever is on social media is in fact reality. So we, uh, we investigated it. Um, we are uh, very aware of what uh, is being said, but that does not mean that, um, you know, we're, uh, have tried to um, sidestep an issue that in fact, that is not what we did. We went right at it and, uh, and a very, very uh, in-depth um, investigation of, of, it, of the 200 pages of information. And um, there's, um, there are things, Emma, that um, should be private within a family. And that is not our, that's not where we wish to go. And we have no role there. And that is what we said. We have no role in those issues or allegations. Is that at all helpful? Yeah, I guess, thank you. Unless anybody, anybody else has anything to say. I was interviewed by the Ithaca Voice uh, several weeks ago, um, and that article was printed today. Um, that, you know, so I put that out there weeks ago. Um, it's up to the press to decide what they wish to print when they want to print it. Um, but um, I can tell you that uh, Dr. Brown is, uh, I have the utmost respect for him, his work. He is a, is a person. Um, and, you know, we are, we are very pleased that Dr. Brown is going to be able to uh, continue, continue on uh, as superintendent of the Ithaca City School District. I am more than happy to have the best superintendent, one in New York State and one of the best in the country, continue to lead this district. And, uh, and I'm not sure how much clearer I can make that. Um, so we're, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been, uh, a few weeks of discussions back and forth and soul searching on all parts. And um, Dr. Brown, I will not speak for you, but I will speak for me because that's all I can do. But um, we, are, uh, we are pleased that we have our exec team in place ready to take on the challenges as they come before us. And uh, we've talked about several of them already tonight, uh, but uh, our mission is to uh, get this district back to where uh, we can have the students in the classroom, students wherever they can learn uh, most efficiently and best and have the greatest experience that they can. That is, uh, that is what we do and that's what our mission is. And, um, and that's the work that we will be gladly speak to and discuss. Um, and no, I am not going to get into allegations and social media comments about any personnel of this district. And, and uh, if you're looking for more comments about what may be out there, if this is, um, I'm not gonna do it and I'm not gonna do it here and I'm not gonna address it. So if that's clear. Any, any, anyone else wish to um, weigh in? I'm pretty much, uh, I'm pretty much out of water. So I'm, uh, I'm going to stop talking and, um, Are we good? I think you, what you stated was clear, Rob. I think we should move forward. Thank you, Chris. So um, any other discussion items? Uh, you know, we've got our work sessions coming up next week and we have February coming up and um, we're almost already 
through one month of 2021. It's uh, it's been busy. So um, I am uh, very happy, uh, Dr. Brown. Great great evening tonight. Uh, a bit different than the last time. Uh, so we're um, we're happy to uh, get back to work. Um, as I said, Dr. Brown, I have a tie on. It's time to get to work. So uh, you know enough of this COVID stuff. Let's uh, let's play some sports. Let's get the kids in school. Uh, and let's, uh, let's make it to spring. So uh, looking forward to it. So um, without further ado, uh, if no one else has anything, um, we'll, um, we'll close it out and head home. Thank you, everyone.